Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. For this unit, we're going to start our survey across Asia, covering all the important Asian civilizations that developed from the 13 to the 1600s, and bringing us up to speed with developments in that part of the world. So we're going to start with one of the greatest Asian empires, the Ottoman Empire and lay out sort of their course and rise to power and why they became such an enduring fixture in what is today sort of West Asia. The Ottoman Empire was one of three Muslim gunpowder empires that we're going to discuss along with the Safavids and Mughals. Uh, they were known as gunpowder empires because they were the first to incorporate in large-scale gunpowder weapons and the use of these weapons allowed their vast expansion and the growth of their military power. So we're going to deal with each of these in turn but for today specifically we're going to talk about the Ottomans who dominated the Arabian Peninsula, sort of Eastern Europe, Northern Africa, and of course uh, Anatolia and other, the other rest and the rest of West Asia. So here's your, here are your five objectives for today, and let's dive in. The Ottoman story starts with the collapse of the Roman Empire. Now, not the Western Roman Empire, because of course that collapsed back in the year 400, the Eastern Roman Empire. As you hopefully remember from our lessons on Rome, once the Roman Empire split and the Western Roman Empire fell, the Eastern Roman Empire continued to live, carrying on Roman traditions, Roman customs, being the center of Christianity, all of these sort of things. And so the Eastern Roman Empire lasted for another about thousand years, but over time they slowly started to collapse. We talked previously about how the Muslim conquests, although they did not wipe out the Eastern Roman Empire, did significantly decrease their influence, and Islam spread across the region, displacing Christianity. One of the key spreaders of Islam was the famous quote-unquote whirling dervishes, these sort of Islamic performers who did this dance in, in order to highlight sort of their religious you know, scruples and to, to uh, demonstrate you know, the love of God through this art form. And so uh, the whirling dervishes were important at sort of spreading Islamic teachings across what is called Asia Minor there on the map and uh, converting the local population to Islam. And today in Turkey, the whirling dervishes are of course an important cultural phenomena that you can go see if you, go, if you ever go visit Turkey. The founding of the Ottoman Empire itself was from one of the various Turkic tribe, tribe peoples, a guy named Os Osman. Osman had, a, had this vision, this dream, that one day he and his descendants would form this great empire. And so this was his inspiration, and he used the sort of power vacuum as the Byzantine Empire collapsed to start over time incorporating in the other Turkic peoples and expanding his power on sort of the central Anatolian plain. The guy who really helped to expand Ottoman power was the awesomely named Bayezad the Thunderbolt. His use of heavy cavalry and horse archers, sort of hearkening back to his Turkic roots, allowed him to conquer significantly more territory, challenge the Romans, and spread the power of the Ottomans of the House of Osman across the Anatolian Peninsula. One of the things that one of the things that Bayezad introduced that helped them do this was the Devshirme system. The Devshirme was a system of incorporating in subject peoples by taking the children of these subject peoples and funneling them into this system of assessments. Based on their aptitudes and their performance on these tests, they would be sorted into either the, the schools to become palace administrators, viziers, uh, government officials, or they would get pushed into the Janissary Corps. And so the effect of this, and we'll talk more about the Janissaries later, but the effect of this is that, quote, a man cannot rise to high rank just because, he, just because he comes from a great family. When the Sultan appointed a man to any post, he neither attached any importance to his wealth nor listens to any empty entreaties. He looked only for capability, character, innate ability, and talent. And in this way, everyone is rewarded according to his own capability and talent. And in every man there is a post who can do his work thoroughly. So, similarly to what we saw in the Mandarin system brought in by the, Han, the Qin and Han dynasties in China, the Ottomans are sorting people into their bureaucracy based on their capacity, not based on their family or their wealth. 
The other, the other advantage of the Dev Shermay is it created this order of elite warriors known as the Janissaries. So for those who were not cut out to be viziers or go to the great palace schools, they were funneled into the Janissary Corps. The Janissary was a corps of very incredibly well-trained shock troops. They were the heart of the Ottoman military, and they would sit at the center of the Ottoman lines making sure that the center would always hold, and then waiting for an opportunity to launch a strike into the enemy's weak points. Originally, the, the Janissaries were capable with both, sword, with both sword, spear, and of course with the bow, but over time, they're going to start incorporating in firearms, and the Janissaries are going to be your main shock infantry of the Ottoman Empire. This is, of course, part of the larger military revolution, as these broad-headed arrows, spears, and then later guns start becoming incredibly effective against mounted troops, you're going to displace the traditional noble structure, and instead it's going to be essential for rulers to be able to field a massive number of, gra of infantry, which of course costs, costs less money to outfit than your, uh, than your noble horse-armored soldiers. And is going, are going to be incredibly effective in combat, especially once they're lined up and firing in unison. And so spectacular discipline and training is necessary for these troops, and so you need to, you need to be able to hire and keep them trained for a long period of time, and that costs significant money, and so only the central government is able to do that. Lesser nobles and princes generally are no longer able to field armies, and so the, the state now is going to have a monopoly on military power. All of this led to significant expansion of the Ottoman Empire. They're also going to incorporate in large cannons as siege weapons in order to break down the massive walls of pre-modern towns. And so up until this point, the Roman strategy was if we build massive castles around all of our towns, yes, you know, enemies can pillage the countryside, but at least they can't threaten our population centers. Well, with the influx of all of this wealth, the Ottomans are starting to start to build huge cannons, and guess what? Now they can blow up castle walls, and castles become much less effective. So the Ottomans are going to, over time, continue their expansion. There's a brief halt where they crash into Timur the Lame, Tamerlane, and his empire. Uh, the Ottomans lose a number of key battles to Tamerlane and lose control of sort of the, uh, what used to be Mesopotamia. But Tamerlane's going to die, and the Ottomans are going to fight back, and his empire will collapse. And so they will survive the great conqueror, the scourge of God, Tamerlane, and continue to grow. Specifically, <clears throat> the main target for the Ottomans was the city of Constantinople. It was the grandest city in the world at this point. It had been for almost a thousand years. Constantinople was protected by the legendary Theodosian walls, three layers of defenses that had been unbreached for almost a thousand years. Until Mehmed II, Mehmed the Conqueror, raised a massive army, built huge cannons, and blew huge holes in the Theodosian walls. Then he launched his assault and, quote, but now came the Janissaries, disciplined, professional, ruthless warriors, superbly trained, ready to die for their master, the Sultan. They assaulted the now exhausted defenders. They were pushing their way over the bodies of dead and dying Muslims and Christian soldiers. With tremendous effort, the Greek and Italian fighters were hitting back and continued repulsing the enemy. Then a group of enemy soldiers unexpectedly entered the city from a small sally port called Kirk Kirkporta on the wall of uh, Blanchernet where the wall joined the triple wall. Fighting broke out near the small gate with the defenders trying to eliminate the intruders. And so the shock troop of Janissaries broke into the city and Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, becoming the central city of the Ottoman Empire and eventually being converted into their capital. So Mehmed the Conqueror made the Ottoman Empire into this glorious world power. He also pushed up into Asia, conquering Greece, conquering uh, the sort of old Roman lands of uh, what is today Hungary, Romania, places like that, and pushing all the way up almost to the borders of Austria. Constantinople had at this point been, although it was a grand city, its population had significantly declined. But when the Ottomans take over, it now becomes a center of culture and learning in the Muslim world, becomes revitalized, and again becomes one of the leading cities in, in all of the world. 
The Ottomans were incredibly interested in trade with Europe and facilitating trade with Europe. They extensively mapped Europe far better than the Europeans had maps of basically anywhere else. This is a 13, 14th century Ottoman map of Europe with spectacular accuracy as far as the geography and the political boundaries of the European countries. Within the empire, Mehmed and his successors were able to incorporate in subject peoples for similar ways than the Persians did. They had a system called the millet system, which allowed each community to more or less run their own affairs, choose their own leaders, and worship in the way that they chose. Although the Ottomans were Muslim, they allowed everyone living in their empire, as long as they paid a head tax, the jizya, they could continue to worship however they wanted, and their leaders could continue to make decisions, as long as they didn't conflict with the general orders of the sultan. And so because under Ottoman rule, the Ottomans brought infrastructure and peace, similarly to how the Romans had, you didn't see a lot of pushback to Ottoman rule within the empire. The millets could also then petition once a year, could send petitioners to the sultan through their chosen leaders, and he would hear their, their problems and deal with whatever their issues were. And so the Ottomans were able to incorporate in a vast array of subject peoples pretty smoothly by ruling with a relatively light hand. The Ottoman Empire itself, the court, became known as the Sublime Port. It, uh, its, its opulence, its glory, its uh, architecture blew away Europeans who showed up there. Europeans who showed up in the great city of Constantinople saw a world unlike any that they had seen in Europe. This is the early days of the European Renaissance, and European cities look very medieval still, whereas the Ottoman Empire, massive mosques, huge construction, unbelievable opulence and wealth, and any European who went there was overawed and desperately wanted to trade and benefit from the amazing accomplishments of the Ottoman Empire. The next great Ottoman Sultan and conqueror was Selim the Grim. He launched campaigns capturing the traditional Muslim areas of both, he bo so he both captured the two Muslim holy cities of Mecca and Medina, and after taking Mecca and Medina, and we can see here the Kaaba here in Mecca, he took on the title of, he took on the title of uh, he took on the title of supreme leader of the Muslim world or caliph. So the Ottoman ruler became the caliph of Sunni Islam and both a political head of the Ottoman Empire, but also the religious head of the Muslim world. And Egypt provided a massive supply of grain for the Ottoman Empire, making sure that not only were they food secure, but they could now export grain to others, making massive amounts of money. Egypt has always sort of been the breadbasket of the Mediterranean and the Roman Empire, and controlling Egypt provides significant security and wealth. And so bringing in both the Muslim cities and becoming caliph and controlling Egypt substantially improved the power, increased the power of the Ottoman Empire. But by far the most famous sultan in the Ottoman world is Suleiman the Lawgiver. Suleiman presided over the Muslim Golden Age. He was known as the Lawgiver or the Kanun because he created this law code called the Kanun, which established codified law, similarly how new monarchs were in Europe, provided equal treatment for everyone under the law. He, and it says here he created a fair, and a fair tax system. And he continued the millet system, allowing freedom of worship to Christians and Jews living in his empire. So, quote, no man was persecuted for his religion in 16th century Turkey, when all over Europe, not only in Spain, inquisitions were at work, and the skies were reddened by the glare of, of fires in which thousands of unbelievers perished. In matters of personal hygiene, there was no question where the superiority lay. Cleanliness in Constantinople was reckoned an integral part of godliness, and the Turks jeered unmercifully at their Western European contemporaries who did not wash their bodies all over more than twice between birth and death. So the Ottoman Empire is a center. Well, Europe is, is fighting the wars of religion, is fighting the Thirty Years' War. Inquisitions are happening all over the place. In the Ottoman world, you've got peace, you've got prosperity, you've got massive wealth, you've got tolerance, you've got uh, the center of culture and uh, you have the center of culture and learning. Suleiman also created a massive navy for the Ottoman Empire and put the city, uh, put the city uh, of Vienna under siege. Uh, although he never took the city of Vienna, Vienna because of uh, problems in other parts of the empire, he did make the Ottomans a massive naval power across the uh, Mediterranean, and the Ottoman Empire reached its greatest extent under the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent, or Suleiman the Lawgiver. During this golden age, trade flowed throughout 
all throughout all of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was the center of Islam with Islamic scholars and imams putting out religious texts and uh, you know creating new and uh, interpret interpretations and pieces of literature. The Ottoman Empire also became a center of Islamic literature and poetry and we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of cultural importance from all of those things. And of course, the massive wealth of the Ottoman Empire, everyone wanted to do business with them because they were right in the center of trade between the Mughal Empire, who we're going to talk about later, the Ming Dynasty in China, who we're also going to talk about later, and Europe, who we already discussed. And so Europe has got all this wealth and they're interested in new ideas, and the Ottoman Empire becomes the purveyors of all these ideas, allowing and filtering them back into Europe. We also get the creation of the fabulous Blue Mosque, one of Istanbul, the modern name for Constantinople's, most noticeable landmarks. We see it here rising above the amazing Hagia Sophia that was created by Justinian. So both of these are now mosques and museums in, in Constantinople or Istanbul, and they are some of the most recognizable buildings and, and uh, architectural creations in the entire world. But unfortunately, what brought down Suleiman and what weakened the Ottoman Empire in the years after his reign was politics within the, the royal family itself, within his harem. Suleiman had one wife that he prized above all others, a woman named Roxalana. He was super in love with her, and, his, and their relationship and their backstage maneuvering was legendary. It became the, uh, it's become the topic of an incredibly popular Turkish soap opera called The Magnificent Century that you can go and watch with subtitles if you're interested. It's super popular within the Muslim world, at least. And I've read that in South America, it's also very popular. So it's about Suleiman and his wife, Roxalana. And upon the death of Suleiman, Roxalana had maneuvered to have all of his other sons disinherited. Some of them were blinded. Some of them were maimed in other ways in order to make them unfit for rule. All the way to pave the way for Roxalana's son, Selim, who uh, is generally referred to as Selim the Sat because he's not a particularly good and inspiring ruler. The only reason that, uh, that he ended up being, becoming sultan was because of the manipulations of Roxalana. And so because of this, Quote, the monarch who was never permitted to leave the prison till he ascended to the throne was likely to be effeminate and inefficient. It was hardly possible that he could resist the intoxication of absolute power, and the unlimited indulgences of his passions seemed almost the certain consequence of his former debaucheries and his entire lack of experience. The love of wine, which this prince often indulged to excess, was the cause of all the evils of his reign, and it was in his moments of intoxication alone that he was capricious, cruel, and unjust. To the public officers of government he was severe, but not to the poor, mild and lenient, but to the poor, mild and lenient. And so because, of all of, because the Ottoman bureaucracy was so effective, the Ottoman Empire is going to continue to last for about 3,000 years, but the rise of a series of not particularly capable sultans is going to significantly weaken the power of the empire, and we're going to see a slow and gradual slide downward after the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent. So those are our objectives today. Hopefully you're able to answer these. Uh, I realize that I did not get to the conflict between the Ottomans and the Safayids, so you can wait to write that objective until we get to until we do the Safayids tomorrow, and then you'll write that CEI for tomorrow. So that's the Ottoman Empire. Thank you for listening.